Amen. And so have you all been blessed by this Be Christmas series so far? Last Sunday, I heard amazing things and uh, just the impact that all of you made by helping to wrap gifts and to be able to distribute those to all those families. You were able to love on people. You didn't just do Christmas. You were Christmas last Sunday. And man, just excited to hear what God is doing in your lives through this series. And can you all believe Christmas is in just over a week? That's a reminder to all the husbands in here. Get your gift for your spouse, okay? Uh, but this Christmas time has always been called, there's songs about it, it's called, it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? I've been listening to Christmas songs since probably September in my office, and I've heard this song 11 times. I had to make up a new number because it got that high, but it's the most wonderful time of the year. And then they say it's also, it's the happiest season of all, right? But if we're honest, and we know a lot of people in our circle of influence, it's not the most wonderful time of the year. It's actually one of the most loneliest times of the year for many people. While many families are experiencing happiness and joy with their family and friends, there are many who are depressed, there are many that are hurting, there are many that are lonely, there are many that are stressed out about their finances during this time. There's many that are frustrated, and there are people that are abandoned during the most wonderful time of the year. And the reason why people struggle at Christmas time is because all of us, we long for one thing in our lives. In one form or fashion, we all chase after it in one way or another, each of us wants to know love, to feel love, and to experience love. We have an innate desire to be loved and to love. Each of us have it. And because that desire is within us, it motivates us to make choices in life, whether they're good or bad, in order to find a truly satisfying love or to really truly find true love. You see, the problem with finding true love is for the most part, our world and our country is very confused about what true love really is. And many times you can find out what a country believes about any particular topic if you do one thing. Just listen to the country's music. You wanna know what our country thinks about anything, listen to the music. So I sat back and I said, you know what, let me think of some songs that deal with love and let's see what does our society teach us about love. You know that song? I'm not gonna sing it because I would make all of you cry. I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. And I will always love you until you no longer make me happy and we end up in a divorce because you don't make me happy, right? This one by Pat Benatar, love is a battlefield. Falling in love with you sounds dangerous. What's love got to do with it, right? Has nothing to do with it, whatever, let's just throw love out the window. Addicted to love, now love is an addiction. You give love a bad name, right? Tainted love, somebody clap for that. <laughs> Whoa, don't point to who you're referring to. We'll just, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I gotta move on. Uh, we'll love you tomorrow. Like, will you still love me tomorrow? Maybe, hopefully, yes. Then there's this one, I'd do anything for love. I would do anything. I would do anything, but I won't do that whatever that is, okay? And then this one, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. And then you, da, 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 you dance. <laughs> but as I went through the list of those songs, I mean, the love and the way people described it is all over the map. It's all over. People are confused about it. We don't know what it is. And here's what happens. Each songwriter who wrote these lyrics has taken this idea of love and aspect and given their own personal definition of it. 
And they have said, love is kind of like our society says, love is relative. Whatever you think is love, then that's what love is. And so that's why you get all these songs that are all over the map. They all don't make sense. And we wonder why our people are walking around wondering, where can we find true love? Because we don't even know as a country and society what true love really is. And so you have people, and I'll do this just to be punny, is that you have people looking for love in all the wrong places. Right? And it doesn't take long to realize, we can sit back and say, no, we are allowed to love in whatever way we feel like we should love, and that's how it's supposed to work. Really, if that's really how true love works, then why is our world so broken? If true love is left for me to decide what it is, shouldn't it be working? It's not. When I turn on the news, what do I see? Okay, love works, great. Sexual allegations in the news. Doesn't sound like it's working to me. If love is working, where are we looking for? We have divorce at an all-time high. The moment I am no longer happy, you are out of my life so I can find somebody else. Marriages are no longer valued. They're looked at as a waste of time. Does this sound like true love is working in our society? Racial injustice, is that love at work? Orphans and widows neglected by society. Doesn't sound like love is working to me. There was a terrorist attack in the New York subway last week. Why? Because people don't love the things that that terrorist suspect loves. And because of that, we hurt. Families are destroyed, catch this, because a parent loves themselves more than their family. How's that? They love their career, they love their hobby, they love their addiction, they love their pornography more than they love their family, and families are torn apart. And there are so many factors that I could sit back and as we think about that lead many people to feeling unloved at Christmas because no one is knowing where to find the true definition of love and because of that, we look for it in all these other places except where true love is truly found. But here's the truth. Our country, our city, our church is in desperate need of knowing, feeling, and experiencing true love. What is love? It's exactly what the Apostle John addresses in 1 John chapter 4. So if you have your Bible with me, um, you can turn to 1 John 4 if you have it on your your phone, whatever it is. I'll also have it on the screens for you. But we'll be in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. This is what John the Apostle says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God, and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. The last couple of weeks we looked at what it means to be Christmas through our worship and our giving. In this passage, John shows us that for us to be Christmas, we are to love all. And he's gonna give us three principles in these short verses that I just read to help us love all so that we don't waste our Christmas season. First thing I put in your notes this way, I wrote it down like this. Love is initiated by God. Love is initiated by God. Read to you verse seven and eight again. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from where? God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So John teaches us a beautiful truth. He reminds us that true love is initiated by God, or in other words, it originated in God, and not only did it originate in God, but God himself is love. 
Now, John is not getting into a theological debate. He's not saying love is the most important attribute of God. It's not what he's doing. What he is telling us is, look, God is love, and the only way we know what true love is is because God is love and has shown us what true love looks like. That's John's point. And you might be thinking, well, how has God shown us his true love? All you have to do is pick up the Bible and start with the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, and you get these amazing words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then as you keep reading, you see a God who carefully creates land, water, trees, fish, birds, animals, all these mountains that we see, you see God carefully putting pieces into place. He puts stars in the sky. He puts galaxies far, far away. He puts the sun and the moon to all work in order in its place. And why? Why is God doing this? Why is God creating, taking such time to create this beautiful place? Why? Because he's getting ready to give his most prized creation a place to live, which is us, his people. And everything you see around you is because God wants us to enjoy his beauty. He wants us to enjoy him. He wants us to know and experience his love. Think of all the beautiful places in creation you have ever been. You ever been someplace in nature and you're like, wow, I can't believe I'm here. This is amazing. This is God's glory. Have you ever been anywhere like that? Okay. Now, my wife and I, we were in New York last Saturday and it was snowing the whole day and the whole night, it felt like. And by the time the sun went down and we made it, we finally made it to Central Park. And Kelly was like, hey, we need to go into Central Park. And I'm like, (laughs) okay, I'm just gonna follow you at this point because I can't even think enough to argue back to say no. So we go in there and I wish I had a picture. I don't have it, I'm terrible at taking pictures. But when we went, went out there, because it was snowing all day, every place we looked, There was snow everywhere. There was a creek that hadn't frozen over yet. I didn't know how. But then on the sides of the bank, it had snow there. There was snow on the park benches. I even went up and touched the bench like, ooh, I just touched Central Park bench with snow. And we sat back and we took pictures in it. We were under a lampstand that had snow at the bottom. And we looked at it. We're like, wow, this is beautiful. So even something as simple as snow declares the glory of God. And God's creation points praise and glory back to our God in heaven. And God created this space for us, for you. He took all the time to do that so you could experience his goodness and his grace. This is his love that was given to you. Then if you keep reading scripture, you see something unimaginable happens, unthinkable. Man, with all this beauty around him says, I want to be just like you, God, and God, and disobey God, and sin, and idolatry, and death were brought into God's world. And if we're honest to admit it, if we were God in that moment, we probably would have annihilated man off the face of the planet because that's how we are as people. But God doesn't do that. Despite our disobedience, despite the wickedness, despite all the things that came into the world because of our sin, God provided a way out of sin, death, and idolatry. He disciplined them, yes, but he offered them forgiveness for sins and allowed them the opportunity to remain his children. Then as you read the rest of scripture, you see a God who says, I am willing to forgive your sins. All you must do is put your faith in me, turn from your wicked ways, and you will be my children. I will be your God, and I will be a God ready to forgive, ready to save, ready to give life, ready to give love, knowing you could do nothing in return to earn it or deserve it. Folks, that is true love. You see, anyone in here who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, you know true love. You've experienced God's true love. You felt God's true love. We know the grace that we have been given. We realize it is an unconditional love that God gives us, one we could never earn and we could never deserve. And we declare This verse that 
the Apostle Paul penned long, long, long ago. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us, and we declare it saying, yes, because God loves us, even though I'm a sinner, I can have life in him. God's love is great. But you see, that's not where love ends. It's not just the fact that once God forgives my sin and gives me new life, I just love God, God loves me, and I sit back and I just enjoy all the blessings of God. That is not where love ends. You see, where love ends is in us loving others the way God has loved us. Look with me again. It says this, that our love is to be as God loves, and since God loves, so should his children. In verse 7, 8, it says, Beloved, let us do what? Love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God. And catch the la- verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. What, what is John saying? In other words, if we are truly God's children, right, then we are to love others as he has loved us. Since he is our father, that means we should be like our father and loves as he loves. This is why John says it is impossible for someone to say, I love God but then not to love. He says, it is impossible for you to be a child of God because if you are a child of God, your father is love, and because he's love, you will be loved because you are your father's child. So if you declare, I love God, and I'm of God, but you never love, you might have to sit back and say, are you truly a child of God? Because John says, it's impossible to say God is love, and I love God, but not love the people around you. You with me this morning? You see... I'll illustrate it to you this way. You know that old saying, like father, like son? Okay, that's, this is the exact same scenario. What's the idea? Simply this, that a son resembles his father. Okay, and there's different ways that can happen, mannerisms, gestures, posture, appearance, habits. And I'll illustrate it with me. I mean, have you ever seen little kids, little boys, where maybe a dad's shaving their face, and a little boy, like, takes, like, shaving cream, puts it on his face, and he has no hair on his face, and he's shaving. And what is he doing? He's copying his dad. Or the dad's out mowing the grass, and the little boy has, like, that toy lawnmower with the little bubbles that float at the top or something. It's like, bloop, 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 bloop. And he's, I'm mowing the grass like my dad. And what, what's the idea behind that, that these children are looking up to their dad and they want to be like their dad and they want to do things just like their dad because their dad is their hero, their dad is their love and so they copy and they do that and they want to be just like the father and I know for me I resemble my father in several, several ways my mom says you know I look a lot like him, she also says I have chicken legs like him so it's true I own it, she says I walk like him and then there was even a time I have a picture of even when I tried to be like him when I was little by wearing his work shoes. So I think I have a picture up there. So there I have on his work shoes. Um, That's where all my crazy shirts came from is, I don't even know what I'm wearing, but it started way back then. So, but no. But what was the idea? For me, those are the shoes my dad wore. And I looked up to my dad. I love my dad. So me as a little boy, my dad wears these boots. I'm going to put them on. I'm going to be just like my dad. It's what we as God's children are supposed to do as well, is, man, I want to be like my father, my daddy in heaven. He has loved me so graciously. I'm going to love the same way that he's loved me, and I'm going to love others that same way. You see, God offers his love to all without conditions. I'll say that again. He loves all without conditions. We have freely received God's love, and we should freely give God's love to all. So this Christmas season, we don't just have an opportunity to love all. It is in our nature to love all because our Father is love. And so we don't love just because it's a great thing to do. No, we love others because it is who we are as God's children. Here's the second thing. I wrote it down like this. Not only is love initiated by God, but love requires sacrifice. Love requires sacrifice. In verse 9, it says this. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
This verse, these two verses get right to the heart of Christmas. The ultimate gift of love is the one that God gave to the world. The greatest gift ever was God sending his son, Jesus Christ, as a baby to be born, to live, to breathe, and to die for a purpose. And what was for that purpose? So that you in this room could experience God's love and mercy and grace through the death that Jesus died on that cross and through his resurrection. And all who place their faith in him will experience God's love. But Jesus needed to make a sacrifice for you. You see, this gift was given, and yes, it's free to us in the sense that all we have to do is cry out in faith, Jesus is Lord, Father, forgive me. It's free to us, but it costs God his one and only son. He knew the moment that when he sent Jesus as a baby and the world is coming to the manger to see this child that was born and the heavens declared it through the angels, the shepherds came from far, the wise men came from afar to see this baby and at Christmas time we celebrate the birth of this baby but God knew the moment he sent his son into the world to become flesh, to become one of us, he knew that in 33 years his son would be beaten and killed, take his final breath and Jesus would hang on the cross and say it is finished and breathed his last breath so that, here's why, so that we, all who put our faith in him, when we, when we take our last breath, we will take our first breath of eternal life with God forever. You see, you see, this is the greatest example of love that has ever been displayed, but it requires sacrifice. First John 3.16 says it this way, the Apostle John goes, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. To stop, just think about that for a moment. Jesus laid down his life for you. Your greatest mistake Jesus said, despite that greatest mistake, I'm laying my life down for you. Why? Because he loves you unconditionally, knowing you can never pay him back and never earn his love. You see, he showed us that he was willing to give us the ultimate sacrifice and that we, in turn, should love others even though it's going to require sacrifice for us to love all. Because the last part of 1 John 3, 16 says it this way. Yes, Jesus laid down his life for us, but then it finishes, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. What's the idea? Just as Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life to love us, we must sacrifice our lives, our wants, our desires to love others. Are you with me this morning? See, here's the hard part about that. Because to be Christmas, to love all, we must love all unconditionally. Even the sandpaper people in your life. The ones that can be irritating. See, it's all people. It's not a select few. It's not just the church fam. It's everyone, and everyone includes the people that are broken, that are rough to be around, that, yeah, they're going to hurt our feelings. Yeah, they're going to do things that make us angry. But God says those are the ones you are to love. Why? Because think of all the times we have rebelled against our Father. And our Father has graciously given us love after love after love, limitless love. You see, there's many of us, if we're honest, we tend to love, I'm, in, I'm, I'm here with you guys too, I'm not talking just to you, I'm talking to myself in here. We tend to love those who love us. Tend to love those who are easy to love. We tend to love those who can in some way enrich our lives. And I think that's the biggest one we struggle with where if I go and invest in this person who's just going down the wrong path and I go and love on them, they're not going to be able to benefit me. How is that going to benefit my life? Newsflash, it's not about your life being benefited through your love. 
It's about that person's life being changed because you're loving them the same way God has loved you. You see, and it is a love that is unconditional. As I was preparing this message um, this week, I came across a video from a rabbi that was absolutely on point, and it's on the topic of fish love. So I'm going to have you guys check this video out now. And why are you eating that fish? And the man says, because I love fish. He says, oh, you love the fish. That's why you took it out of the water and killed it and boiled it. He said, don't tell me you love the fish. You love yourself. And because the fish tastes good to you, therefore, you took it out of the water and killed it and boiled it. So much of what is love, right, is fish love. Right? And so, young couple falls in love. Young man and young woman fall in love. What does that mean? That means that he saw in this woman, someone who he felt could provide him with all of his physical and emotional needs. And she felt in this man, somebody she feels that she can write, that was love, right? But each one is looking out for their own needs. Right? It's not love for the other. The other person becomes a vehicle for, for my gratification. Too much of what is called love is fish love. Right? An external love is not on what I'm gonna get, but what I'm gonna give. We had an ethicist, Rabbi Dessler, who said, the people make a serious mistake in thinking that you give to those whom you love. And the answer is, the real answer is, you love those to whom you give. And his point is, if I give something to you, I've invested myself in you, right? And since self-love is a given, everybody loves themselves, now that part of me has become in you, right, there's part of me in you that I love. Right? So, true love is a love of giving, not a love of receiving. He makes that, he makes that very truthful statement. True love is a love of giving, not a love of receiving. The Apostle Paul says the same thing, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. But we all struggle with, we all want to receive love. And many times our love that is given to others is based upon the fact, will this person love me in return? And we're thinking about it the wrong way around. To really live this out, we must be willing to sacrifice to give this kind of love. We must be willing to sacrifice time, finances, effort, food, clothing, our homes, personal comfort, to show the world God's love. And you might sit back and say, why, Brad? Why? Because that's what God our Father has done for us. Here's the third thing that we'll close with this morning is love gives life. Love gives life. See, verse 11 and 12 say this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. What, is, what does John mean in these two statements? Here's what it is. The world has not seen God. So how are people going to see God? How are they going to know who God is? How will they know that God is love? Catch this, it's by you and I and all of those who call ourselves Jesus' disciples going out and loving others and saying, this is how God's love is made known, by the love that we have for one another and for the entire world. As you and I go out and love and sacrifice and give and don't look to receive, as we begin to do that, we will show the world who God is and how loving of a God he is. And as we do that, we will give life to this world. You see, it said earlier, just a few verses earlier, it said that through faith in Christ, he, he died for our sins. Why, that? So, why is that? So that we might live through him. And Jesus has given us life. And as we go out and love those who are hurting, broken, that we go out and tell them, look, there is a God who loves you. And as God uses us to love on those people, catch this, when they give their life to God and they cry out in faith to him, guess what God gives them? God gives them life. 
You see, this is why God is wanting us to go out and to love because God sent Jesus into the world to say, this is what I look like. This is me. When you look at Jesus, you see me. When you look at the way he loves, this is how I love. When you look at the way that he saves, this is how I save. When you look at how he forgives, this is how I forgive. Well, Jesus has gone to the Father, and now it is our responsibility. Jesus tells all of us, you are the light of the world. You see, it is now our responsibility, our duty, our mission to be the light everywhere that we go, to love all and point them back to Christ so that through our love, they will receive life from their Father. You see, N.T. Wright stated it this way, and it will be up on the screen for you as well. He says, the Christian faith grows directly out of and must directly express the belief that in Jesus the Messiah, the one true God, has revealed himself to be Love incarnate. And those who hold this faith and embrace it as the means of their own hope in life must themselves reveal the self-same fact before the watching world. Love incarnate must be the badge that the Christian community wears, the sign not only of who they are, but of who their God is. And so to be Christmas this season, it is to love all, unconditionally and the hope is that it's not just this Christmas season love all it is from every other day outside of Christmas season to love all someone once made a comment about churches and described it this way it says churches should have a danger sign outside of their doors warning people to expect nasty gossipy snide conversation and behavior if they came inside. Anybody who's ever been to a church where you were offended by a church member, a Christian? You ever been in a place where you're like, man, I was treated better in the world than I was at the church. If that thought has ever crossed your mind, what's the reality? The reality is, yeah, that's the story of the church world. We've done a bad job about loving all because we made it about what we can benefit from. We made it about what we can receive from people and it becomes, well, this is what we want. This is what we want to do. And then when it doesn't happen, gossip, snide conversations happen. But church, we can turn the tide. This is why the apostle John is writing to Christians. He's like, look guys, look, we can't be like the world. Let's not act like them. We are called to be different. We are called to love. Let's not love like them. Let's, let's change this. Let's turn this around. Let's let it be when people look at Christians, they see Christ. When they look at churches, they see Christ. When they look at the way that we love, it's a love where they feel, man, I've never experienced a love like this. Why? Because we have to offer them the only love that's really going to make a difference in people's lives. We have Jesus' love, God's love, and we can give that to everyone who walks through these doors. But it takes you and I to begin to live this out. John says it this way in John 3, 17 through 18, 1 John 3, 17 through 18. He says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. We as a church have done a great job of talking about love. We have not done a great job about walking and love. And that's the point John wants us to grasp today, is we must put love into action for it to be fruitful. It's time to start, stop talking about it, and it's time to start walking in. Are you with me this morning? Because guess what? Yes. Because here's why. There is a dying, hurting, broken, lost world that is dependent upon us to reveal God's love to them. It is heaven or hell for us. And people in this world are either on the road to hell or the road to heaven. That's it. There's no in between. And as we love them and begin to realize, man, every opportunity we have to give life, let's give life. And so this Christmas season, I want to challenge each of us in here this morning, my wife and I included, don't waste this Christmas season And here's what I would challenge you to do. You might say, Brad, what can I walk away with? What can I do today? Here's what it is. Pray and say, God, 
what is one random act of kindness I could do for somebody else this Christmas season? And sit back and say, God, what would you have me to do? You might say, Brad, what do you mean by a random act of kindness? Does that mean I have to spend a bunch of money? No, it's not about money. It's about what can you do to love? What can you listen to God's whisper telling you what to do? Because there's a lot of things. It could be for someone, God might tell you, cut that person's grass over there that can't cut it or doesn't have a lawnmower. It could be visit someone who's shut in their house and they can't ever get out to church, but you know who they are. It could be loving on those in a nursing home. It could be buying a stranger's groceries that need it. It could be paying for someone's coffee. It could be as simple as inviting somebody over for Christmas who will be spending it alone. It could be writing a note of encouragement to someone who's depressed. And the reality is this, look, the possibilities are endless because our God's love is limitless and what he needs to do in people's lives through us He's going to tell us different things because he's going to use us in different ways. Why? So that we could give life to all, so that we could love all. You see, a few years ago, my wife and I, we were working at a Christian school, and we were in charge of doing chapels for the elementary program. And the church was going through a series on loving others and going out and doing random things for people. And so... I sat back and we were thinking about, okay, God, what would you have us to do? And um, one of the things that God put in my heart was like, you know, Kelly is like, I really I feel like I need to go buy a bike from the toy store and we got to give it away during our Christmas chapel for the elementary. And so we went and we bought this bike and we, have this, we went to the school administrators. We said, hey, we don't want this bike to just go to somebody who has everything. We wanted to go to a family who needs it, where this is going to be something where they will be blessed by the gift. And so the administration picked a child. They were going through a difficult time as a family and all that. And so we called a little boy up on the stage. And, um, and so it came to that moment. We said, okay, we're giving a bike away to this kid up here. He came up. We did, he didn't know why he was coming. We said, we're going to give you a bike today. And he's like, ah, yeah. And I was like, okay, you ready for your bike? Yeah. So I pulled out a little toy bicycle. And I'm like, here you go. Here's your bike. Ride it around the stage because I'm an idiot and that's what I did. And as I ride it around and he's looking at me like this. Well, while that was happening, they wheeled the real bike around me. And I said, I'm just kidding, man. Actually, we do have a real bike. Turn around and look at this. The kid's eyes were like he was blown away. He was excited. He tried to get on it on the stage and I was like, no, we don't want an accident. But At the end of it all, here's what happened through that family. They felt God's love in a way that they had never had done before because it wasn't anything that they earned or deserved. It was Kelly and I being obedient, saying, okay, God, what would you have us to do for a random act of kindness? And then we were just obedient with that. And I'm not telling you that story to say, oh, Brad, you did a great thing. No, I'm telling you that when you begin, when you see, when you obey what God tells you to do, and you see how it impacts and affects the people that you love on, it makes you want to continue to do that in people's lives because you realize, man, when I love others unconditionally and don't expect anything in return, God does amazing things. God shows up, and that family, that's exactly what they needed that Christmas season, but would have been missed if I would have not listened to God's voice and said, well, I'm a teacher, I'm paying off student loans like I'm going to go broke, God. I don't have the money. And that could have been a thought. But I said, you know what? This is what God is telling me to do. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to sacrifice. And even if I can't eat out for five days in a row, I'm making the sacrifice. And so this Christmas season, you, each of us have the opportunity. My wife and I, we're praying what God would have us to do this Christmas season. And when he tells us what to do, we're going to do that to do it. Not only that, but we also have one week to invite as many unchurched people to Christmas Eve as possible. Because why? Why? Because when they come here and hear the gospel and hear that there is a Savior who loves them, number one, we invite them so they could hear and meet Jesus for the first time. This is also the time of year where if you ask unchurched people, hey, would you like to come to a Christmas Eve service? Most of them will say yes. And so here's what we're going to do. At the end of service, some of our first impressions team are going to be out there handing out invite cards. All you have to do 
is go wherever you normally go as you're going out. Maybe it's the cashier at Publix. Maybe it's the person at Starbucks. Maybe it's somebody at a restaurant. Just say, hey, would you like to come to a Christmas Eve service? Just invite them. That's it. Think about how many hurting people are out there that you could love on them just by inviting them to Christmas Eve. So don't just do Christmas. Be Christmas. And I'm going to close with this last this last story, because when we walk out of here, one of two things is going to happen. There's a story in the Bible, in John chapter 12, where Jesus is six days before Passover, and he goes to a house, to a home, and Mary is there, and she realizes how much she loves Jesus. She takes out expensive perfume, opens up the bottle, pours it all over Jesus' feet, and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. She poured out her most expensive perfume. Judas is sitting there watching it, and he stands up and says, why did you just pour all of that expensive perfume all over? It, we could have sold that and got 300 denarii and given that to the poor. It's not really what he wanted to do. You see, Judas, what he wanted was to keep the bottle so he could sell it and then take a little bit of money out of the money bag for himself. And so you had Jesus sitting there who demonstrated the greatest love of all, and one person who got it who said, you know what, I'm willing to pour out everything to love on someone. But then you had someone else, Judas, who sat back and said, I'm not willing to sacrifice to love somebody if I'm not getting a little cutback in return. And so this Christmas season, the question we have to answer is, as we sit back, we're gonna have to make a choice each day to love all. And we're gonna do one of two things. We're either going to pour it all out and say, okay, God, I'm giving everything I got to pour out my love, or we're gonna make the choice to hold on to it and restrain our love and hold it back. But if you pour your life out, you will give life. If you hold love back, you will not give life. You will hold people stuck in death. This Christmas season, would you pour your life out? Would you pour everything, be willing to give up everything so that others would receive life?